The other thing, uh, Friday, November 1st, will be a memorial reading for Ernesto. Uh, remember that night, and there'll be some flyers going out on that. And also, Thursday, November 7th, uh, Gary Soto and Steve Gutierrez. Also, uh, down the hall, we're going to have refreshments after the reading. And uh, come down and get a glass of uh, sparkling apple berry, I guess it is, or wine or champagne, and take a look at the museum. The galleries are open. Uh, tonight will be uh, Dixie Lane and Omar Salinas. Let me say uh, Dixie. Uh, Dixie is a painter, a uh, very fine painter, very exciting painter. She is shown in this gallery a number of times and rented paintings through here. She's also an electrifying and inspired photographer and is currently teaching poetry at Cor Corcoran State Prison and basic adult education in Fresno. She studied poetry in Fresno with Philip Levine and C.G. Handelcheck. She also received an MFA in poetry from Columbia University and was assistant, assistant editor at Parnassus Poetry Review. She has published in Quarry West, West Wind, Peace Work, 19 Fresno Poets, River Sticks, Plowshares, Graham House Review, Kenyon Review, Antioch Review, Missouri Review, South Florida Review, Poet Lore, and others. She has a very, very fine chat book called Hotel Fresno, uh, published in 1986 by Blue Moon Press. Her poems are among the best examples of narrative movement that include so many things. Uh, they have a natural imaginative quality of not only of voice, but of the mind's discernment. Her choice of material is definitely part of the genius and imagination. Strong enough to collect and work over a lot of material in relevant, humorous ways that speak not only of skill and spirit of talent, but also of friendliness and warmth. She can be turned on and yet so sensitive and uh, having that common sense touch in her poetry. There's enjoyment in the process. Uh, she can be both serious and spontaneous. Whatever she brings into a poem seems so real. Uh, I seem to sense in some of her poems a genuine feminine play of soft over hard. And. Uh, which gives a sense of, of, I think, a broad, a broad, wide sense of things. Deep emotional response, attractiveness, and the way the mind understands the way to deal with material. She is, at times, uh, very shrewd in the use of psychology and images in exposing false pretenses in reflecting on common faiths, many of which have gone wrong, uh, commonly held psychological views that are mistakenly and wrongly applied. She can be uh, intensely sensitive and susceptible in, in ways that bespeak social conscience and uh, great artistic talent. There's a lot of courage and justice in her work. She can expose social dangers and basenesses with what must be some kind of genius and integrity. Uh, because so many lesser poets fail doing that. She is very successful in using uh, material as a vehicle for a much larger, per larger perspective and excellent in conjuring up new ways of seeing old values. And I could go on and on, and I probably will someday, uh, write about all these fantastic poets that come here. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dixie Lane.
Can everybody hear okay? Louder? Like that? Okay. Um, um, sometimes when I hear Chuck's introductions, I think he's talking about someone else. <laughs> Which leads me to the um, title of my first poem, which is called, Why I'm Not Someone Else. Um, and uh, some of you might have noticed that um, I'm using a different name now. Uh, I went back to my maiden name, which was Salazar, the name I grew up with. And I got married uh, in March this year, and I decided I wanted to go back to my maiden name at that time. It's kind of complicated, so I'm not going to try to explain it all. But anyway, um, I'm still getting used to the name, and so still, some other people still are too. Um, but anyway, I guess I was thinking about, it took me a while to, to make that decision, and a friend of mine actually, um, who became a lawyer last year, she went back to law school in her 30s and um, passed the bar on the first trial, which I thought was great. And um, she, we were talking, and she encouraged me to do this. I'd been wanting to do it for a while, and one thing was I thought you had to go through a huge legal process, and I found out you don't. Really, it's very simple. All you do is decide to use a different name. And as long as it's on three major documents, your driver's license and, um, oh, what, what is it? Social Security bank cards or something like that. And as long as you're not doing anything illegal by using a new name, anyone can do it. So you can all go home and have a new name tonight if you want. <laughs> I thought you might want to know that. But anyway, thinking about names, I, I, I wanted to write a poem that had something to do with that. And I was thinking about that. And really, it turned into a different kind of a poem, um, which is the poem I'm going to read. There's a couple of things I need to explain. I've always wanted to have a poem that I can explain things about. So now I do. This, there's, one, there's a mixture of fact and fiction in this poem. And one part of it, this is really from a true story about um, a, um, the, a derivation of the uh, dessert peach melba. There's really a story attached to this which kind of gets into this poem somehow. And this is really a true story. And then there also, there's a, was an old Deborah Carr movie. Um, I forgot the name of it the other night. I was trying to think of it. Oh, and a fair to remember. Did anybody see that? That one where she keeps, she falls in love with this guy in a shipboard romance and they keep missing each other throughout the movie. They're supposed to meet at the Empire State Building a year later and some, they just keep barely missing each other. Anyway, that gets into this too, so. But as you all know, out of all truths, um, all truths come from fiction, and out of fiction comes some truth sometimes. So <clears throat> all of that has to do with this poem. Why I'm not someone else. This is an old story. If my mother hadn't let that soldier buy her a scarlet O'Hara in the sweet gum lounge, and if those two nervous molecules hadn't bumped together in the great cosmic elevator, you wouldn't be reading this now. If your grandfather had been an archaeologist mad about Homer, he might have christened you Agamemnon by laying a copy of the Iliad on your head, instead of the cranky feet salesman who married the muscular gym teacher and called you Northrop instead. And if my grandmother's first suitor hadn't been struck by lightning and she fell for the used car salesman, who quartered her in the cemetery, then I might have been the famous Australian soprano, a shy French chef named his peach dessert after, or the identical twin who almost killed you, boring a dark smack in the center of your back when you were 10. And if the gypsy who turned your palm upward to the Mona Lisa sky had seen that slice of moon hooked over the eaves like a secret smile, she would never have dared predict your mother's amazing luck. The conversation overheard by the nurse on the bus and our story wouldn't be our story. And we might be like Cary Grant and Deborah Carr, passing in separate taxis, the rain swallowing our eyes, missing train connections because of a goat on the tracks, you going up in the elevator while I'm going down. In case of you, any of you did see that movie, you know there was no goat on the track, so <laughs> that's just something I threw in. <clears throat> this 
The next, so that was kind of a newer poem. I'm, from here on out, it's going to be kind of in chronological order. I'm going to read some poems that go back a while. This is um, it's called Hearse. It's an older poem. When I was growing up in Illinois, my father um, belonged to the American Legion, and they I got a hold of an old hearse that they used to haul chairs and things in. And um, my brother and I used to beg him to take us for a ride in it. And sometimes he would, and we'd drive around town in this hearse. And my brother and I thought this was a lot of fun. We'd, you know, we'd, we'd lay down the back of it, pretend like we were dead and things. And um, it was one of the fun things we did in our family. <laughs> but, <laughs> we had, were desperate for fun sometimes. But out of that, there's somehow, there's more to that that I won't even go into. There's another short story that I wrote that has something to do with that in it. But this poem has, um, begins with that in the hearse. Um, and then it goes on to some other things. Hearse. Inside was maroon, like the cushioned crevice of a ring box. Voices going fuzzy as the door shut. Afterwards, they carried my remains downhill. Someone tried to sing, coming for to carry me home, but words spliced off in the wind. No one cried very hard. Ricky read from the second chapter of Zane Gray, our father's adhesive tape glasses slipping down his nose, reflecting back an earthly blur. Later, we scooted back and forth, letting casket rollers tickle our buttocks and thighs. Ricky sat in front, and I tapped on the glass slid close between us. Driver, I'm dead. Take me to the cemetery and step on it. But when Sharon's mother died, they told me she had gone far away to meet Jesus. How did she get there, I asked, thinking of her always in bed and looking so tired. And I had seen her, quieter and paler than usual, but it was her in that box, and I saw it going down, not up. On the way home, crushed between the sashayed ladies, I held the balloon I had gotten with my new black shoes. As I leaned from the open window, my fingers let go, and the string slid easily through. Free of gravity in my small bitten grasp, it swung high over a flock of trees, and only the wind came down rushing into my open throat, lapping my outstretched tongue, sucking my very breath to carry it wherever the wind calls home. <clears throat> um, this next poem I'm going to read for a friend of mine, Diane Trejo. Um, she called one night too long ago and about her daughter who's about 11, who's going through the terrible teens, and um, they're starting to go through the teens earlier now, I think. But, um, and I'm, fortunately, my daughter has grown. She's 20. I was just talking to one of her teachers who was here for a few minutes, and that she used to have in high school, was asking about her. And she's now married, and she'll be 21 this year. And um, she's turned into a, a really lovely young lady and uh, I'm very proud of her. But we went through a, a time when I didn't know what the outcome was going to be for her. She was, she was going through what I refer to now as the Deborah Carr years. Everything was a, a big drama. Everything, she broke a finger now. You know, she was um, in tears for, for days and couldn't be consoled. And it was just, everything was like this, one drama after another. And um, so I wrote this poem for her. And um, I'm reading it for Diane now because um, we were talking the other night and I was saying it, it does get better and it does, things do get better. You do get over this and you live through it. It's called Turning 13 for Krista. Belching loudly over the crickets, my daughter giggles. The night is still and heavy with no moon or stars. We decide they're off floating with the rich on green Caribbean seas. Feigning blindness, she steps into my path, then dogs behind, snagging my heel. She trips on a manhole cover, embossed with stars, walks fearlessly over the ground, crusted with glass, in glittering streetlight pools, 
Headlights beam us into broken shadows, rippled over a chain link fence. So much broken in her life, my heart grows heavy as breasts once sag with milk for this child. Now her baby woman lips are bunched into a mutinous pout. All weak tears and slamming doors. My favorite postcard found with the mermaid's face torn out. My scissors glued together. Then her wet face shining into my room at 3 a.m., swollen with fear, for don't touch body shaking, thin as a glass sun ship. Then she let me hold her, drawing the, lo the long knobby limbs close. I want to tell her. Yes, I know, there are nights when the only stars are etched in the sewer's face, and you must launch your small half-formed craft on rivers of glass that connect dark continents where nothing is known. Last time I read this when she was in the audience and she said, later she says, why did you have to say that about long knobby limbs? <laughs> That's a good thing she's not here tonight. <laughs> okay, this next poem <clears throat> is, well, these are from a series of poems that um, there's a, kind of out of a whole different section of writing where I was playing around with a persona. And most, almost all poems are partly persona, persona, or quite a bit so anyway. But these are where I really took on a different persona. Uh, it was when I was working at uh, the mental hospital doing art therapy. And it was very powerful work. And I found that it was very hard to detach myself sometimes from the people I worked with. They were, they're, their stuff was kind of with me, and it's hard, you know, it was just there in my consciousness, too. And it got into a lot of poems I wrote, happened to write after that time. And I did sort of take on this persona of a, of a woman who remembers back to a childhood that was alcoholic, abusive, and very chaotic. And um, I wrote a series of poems. So, and some of my life things got into this, too. So, this first one is called In the Kitchen with the TV Mothers. This morning, my mother is not snoring under the coffee table. She has put on her daisy apron, and the kitchen is toasted all golden and buttery. Harriet Nelson, June Cleaver, and Donna Reed are complaining about their husbands in the topaz alcove. They don't know I'm in the next room coloring buttercups for the happy mother in the Mother Knows Best color book. The tea kettle erupts with a geyser of steam and the windows glaze over like the jaundiced eyes of saints. Red jello with floating pears sets up in the frigid air. Donna Reed recalls her water breaking in an elevator. June's labor was induced. She had her hair permed, cleaned up the house, called the sitter, Ward was on a business trip, took a cab to the hospital to have the beaver. Lassoed and steam, their faces are red and with O'Keefe and Merritt heat. Now Mother is passing around a silver flask. Harriet recalls the night she hit Ozzy in the face with a wrought iron trivet. I could have had a good life with Ozzy if only I had liked to drink. June thinks Ward is stepping out. Donna Reed's mascara is smearing. Now the kitchen is spinning. There is butter everywhere. Dishes slide off the shelves. The pears have loosened and left footprints across the linoleum and I've spilled my milk again. The page is all wet, this yellow crayon smearing into the mother's face, and no matter how hard I try, I can't stay inside the lines. <clears throat> this next poem is called Doll Hospital. And uh, one thing that's happened too with some of these poems is as you might have noticed in the last one, a lot of, I grew up in the 50s, as you might have guessed, and a lot of things from my child in the 50s got into them. Things that I, there was one about um, um, Nancy Drew, I have a poem about that, Perry Mason and um, Ozzy and Harriet, all those people got into these poems somehow. And um, as they get into this one also, um, also, my father's family was Catholic, and I wasn't raised Catholic because my father had left the 
Catholic Church, and so somehow all that stuff works its way into my poems too. I never have completely understood it. And um, the doll image also is something that I've worked with for a long time. A lot of poems about dolls and things like that. And also in the paintings, a lot of dolls get in there. And the Virgin Mary also, which I don't quite understand completely. I, I think I do sometimes, but I, I don't know. I'm not entirely sure of it, what it all means. This one's called Doll Hospital. My sister was the responsible one. We brought her our tired, wag-eared babies, unsprung sausage curls, eyes of scratched cobalt where hopes and fears collected and reflected back. Pale and implacable with peony smiles, they waited for her touch. She twisted their necks backward, pressed crybaby hearts to her ear. She was Dr. Patient, pudgy fingers playing over hinged and waxy legs. She raised a crumbling baby, cured it and herself with one touch to polyurethane. She sprayed Betsy Wetsy's head silver once, a foil crown of secret royalty or luminous mark for aliens. Sun streaked the dusty walls of her flimsy hospital, crucified the tile. Lucy and Desi spoke through her while she stitched an arm back on. She moved from chart to chart Part sleuth, dispensing pastel pills, a sainted Nancy Drew who never solved the mystery. When they cried, manufactured tears, spoiled satin bows, and rusted their metal perforated hearts. Then she received them, one by one, in a white collar and Perry Mason scowl. Seams twisted, valentine lips unloosed, a runaway train of confessions. Cigarettes on the sly, Snitched bittersweet, what happened under the bed, all shapes and sizes of lies. In the blue veil of afternoon, confessor and sinner merged. She knelt on the cold, unforgiving tile, caught between the blink of pellucid baby blues and the fixed eyes of the lonely lady, watching from her cool alcove, bewildered but always full of grace. One thing I did in this whole series of poems was I um, also experimented with taking on voices of not only this persona, but different things, um, different members of the family would speak, and then at one point, one of her stuffed animals, there's a poem where one of her stuffed animals speaks and remembers things that happened in her room. And this poem I'm going to read next, the last one out of these, uh, this particular batch, <laughs> is called Chopping Down the Family Tree, and it's actually, uh, the tree is speaking. It's coming from the uh, uh, viewpoint of the tree. Teeming with wood ticks, termites, and tight grubs, curled up like black pearls, I have watched the seasons working against each other. But even when choked with blight, I sunk down long roots and survive. Disfigured hearts gouge into my arms, speaking of old flames and repeated patterns. I soak up whatever I can from below to revive the shrunken bitter fruit where worms drilled into a pithy core. Brown and scarred, they fall into mushy pools of rain. This sap is a sour bile that flows from a bitter source but still, I spread small, budding fingers of pink to the faint spring breeze. A fuzzed, accusatory finger inches up and up, winding through pollen and alkaline dust, eating its way to tender tips, but I just go on, sipping from the cool earth, getting by. Some night, when light is trapped in moon-silvered limbs, you'll climb into my sinewy arms, let these old boughs rock you, Half asleep, you'll ride a midnight horse to the moon, gallop over white tundra, kick up dust from crater walls, the sadness of earth light fanned into the Milky Way. And you'll know then, lies and rage have swelled all the rivers that feed into my dark rootage. And you'll know what you must do to survive, and that it must be done quickly and without hesitation. This is a 
poem that, um, it's, it's about New York. Yeah, I went to graduate school there, and um, one thing I really missed was having my car while I was there. And every time I, I found out I wasn't very well suited to living in New York or back east, and um, every time I'd get off the plane and be back here at Fresno, and it was just like this huge weight had been lifted off. And one thing I, I remember is every time you walk out the door there, the street is just right there in your face, and you really can't escape it. And, I mean, there are times when it's kind of fun and exciting, and and um, it's kind of nice. I mean, you want that stimulation. There are times when you don't want it, <laughs> but you've got it anyway. And it's not like here, you get in your car, you roll up the nice you know, windows, and you um, turn on the air conditioning, put on a Pavarotti tape, or whatever you want, and drive to wherever you're going. You don't even know where you are. I mean, you could be anywhere. But uh, when you're in New York, you know it. <laughs> and um, I wrote this poem about New York, and while I was there, I don't know who, somebody had plastered the city with these signs that said, Jesus loves New York. They were everywhere. They plastered all over the city, and it's kind of what led me to, to write this poem. Sort of, in this case, the city is speaking, and it's called The City Speaks. Oh, there was also one more thing I should explain. There were some religious tracts that someone was handing out. You know, they're always handing you something, and, and if you make eye contact with somebody there, then you're no telling what you're going to get. <laughs> But um, I was standing in line to a, waiting for a movie, and they had this tradition that sprung up there where if you're standing in any one spot for any one time, somebody comes around and starts entertaining you, and then they, you're supposed to pay them for this. <laughs> and uh, they have a, uh, we were watching, standing in line for this movie, and some fire jugglers came around, and <laughs> we were juggling fire. We were, yeah, that was what, wait, while we were waiting for the movie to start. And then some people came by after that, passing out these religious tracts. So I, I saved one, and somehow it got, parts of it got into this poem. The city speaks. <clears throat> it says, Jesus loves New York, hugging a telephone pole. It says, mystic moving van, double parked with a Chevy of velvet dice bunnies. And the pavement slicks rain on graffiti-stroked armpits and thighs where stoplights slide. The bum studies her like geography, memorizing the valleys, the slopes, as he rattles his cup in front of the city of hope. And it says, one baby saved, but the system stinks. Bras and girdles are blowing across Broadway. Scallops, 9.50 a pound. The midget in stars and stripes on Amsterdam. His face flecked with colors like lights behind the eyelids of the blind. Steps a quick cha-cha-cha, kissing a parrot on the lips. And it says, St. Veronica, all about the trees, a beautiful blue light runs in streams. The M104 tick ticks, air brakes puff to a stop before La Funeria, where the men at car tables are pushing dominoes for change. And Juanito is walking his lamb. The Old Testament, the Old Testament is not enough, the blue-haired woman screams to dead eyes of Pigeon and Johnny Walker Red. Lining up their shots at the Marlin, men are chalking their cues, spitting on the chip tile floor. Donut holes, what's missing in your life? It says on, one, on the window of Happy Donuts, where the one-legged pigeon bobs for crumbs. And it says, nobody sells it for less as the chickens twirl in the window of chirping chicken. The Rasta man coaxes a wobbly blue moon from a saxophone in front of the Blue Rose Lounge, where Bobby Radcliffe and the Illusions appear nightly. And Lorette Lingerie, where the tasseled penwa says, Tonight, Chiquita, rock me in your red and black peekaboo. Now Jesus is floating with Our Lady beyond the trees across the sky. She is pointing to her side, a ball glows in the sky. Flames on one side, a big hole covers half, and Our Lady is crying. A man is peeing in the gutter between the parked cars. A baby rides a bucking kangaroo, and sidewalks steam, the cab driver dipping into a carton of fried rice on the hood of his cab. Deep in night's velvet, the pearls are locked in the vault of galaxy jewelers, and the moon is the setting of a blind man's eye. And now, sunk in layers of snow, it says nothing to the old woman whose life is stuffed deep into red apple bags 
and the sirens of the skies, and the babies are crying as if from another star. Before I go on, I, I forgot to say something earlier that I meant to say, which was that I also said it was some other wonderful people here. Peter Everwine, who's here tonight, too, and um, Dwayne Rail, and others. So I didn't want to leave anybody out. We've got some wonderful poetry teachers here in Fresno. <clears throat> this next poem is... Um, is a... Uh, poem that I wrote, uh, well, last year was, has to do with the Gulf War, and I don't know if there's much to explain about it, really. I think it's self-explanatory. Um, as Chuck said, I'm working at Corcoran Prison, and um, I was uh, teaching poetry there, and, and it's very challenging, <laughs> and uh, I, I enjoy it, but it's, it's, it's uh, hard, because um, you have to first unteach people a lot because they have ideas of what poetry is and you have to do a lot of unteaching before you can get down to doing the teaching. And um, so some of that, there's a section in here about, um, I was reading Hikmet, the Turkish poet who was imprisoned at that time and uh, I was also teaching at Cochrane Prison, so that's the reference to Hikmet in his poem and Neruda. In the Garden, Thoughts of War. Streaks of yellow tulips swayed in the wind where band practice booms softly on the horizon. Again, a news update cuts into Mozart, carried down from the kitchen window by the wind. My nails fill with darkness where I dig, wanting to resurrect anything at all. Ruthlessly, I must clip back the spider babies, geranium, aloe vera, lost to a killer frost. Pulling at the pulpy body of a dead succulent, it lifts into my palm like a limp toupee. Too many small invasions push through my scattered thoughts, claiming forgotten territories, flagging frying pans, fingernails, kindergarten window. Even the janitor today told me this war is God's recycling plan. Too many empties, he said. That's what the neutron bomb is for. Headlines followed me today, caught in the crevice of a plastic chair at the Chinese restaurant, crumpled at the bare feet of a neon virgin, lining papery soles of the beggar shoes. They even broke into prison where he'd met and Neruda instruct in the fine art of undoing time. I sprinkled snail bait over the violets, flattened crisp shells into the soft ground, knowing even now they are mating under a dark leaf in sticky pears. Last week's paper that slid into a bed of rotting begonias unfolds under my trowel. Strings of ants stream over the soggy headlines around eye sockets of a bird carcass open to the rain like a cup. Turning over compost, blackened leaves and orange peels unlace and crumble. Sow bugs and beetles stir wet leaves carrot and apple paring into a thick soup of humus. Here in the garden, I do what I can. The frost was brutal and swift this year. Now frostbitten bodies lie everywhere. There is nothing to do but clear away, count the losses, and start all over again, singing a broken tune to the cherry blossoms, counting backwards against the brittle wind. I'm just gonna read a couple more poems. Um, these two are, the last two are fairly new. Um, this next one is, is called Ode to a Plumber. And um, we have this plumber, um, he's actually a handy person, he comes and does all kinds of things. Um, the problem with two poets being <laughs> living together, nobody can fix anything in the house. And um, we're lucky to find this guy, he's really wonderful. But he comes to your house and he, when he gets out of his truck, he starts talking. And you can hear him coming, or he even comes to the door, and he comes in the door talking, and he talks all the way into wherever it is, the bathroom, or wherever he's going, and he talks the whole time he's there. Half the time, I don't know whether he's talking to me or not. And my daughter called me up one time and said that 
She says, there's this guy here. She says, and he's, ta he's uh, fixing the furnace. And she says, and, and she says, I don't know whether to talk to him or not. He keeps talking. <laughs> I knew right away it's the same guy. His name is Randy Walker Jr. It gets into the poem. And um, I've recommended him to several people. He's really very good. I'm, I'm in such awe of people who can fix things. And I always think that they're going to charge me huge amounts and it still won't work. So if, it, if they charge me huge amounts and it does work, then I'm getting a bonus. And most of the time when he's fixed things, they've worked pretty good. But um, um, there's some direct quotes from Randy Walker in here. Some of you out there might even have had Randy at your house once or twice. Ode to a Plumber. All morning the sun slipped in and out of dishwater haze, and the shadow of my teacup is the only mark on the white deserted page. My fingers have drummed to house rhythms, the tea kettles wheezing, the tick and talk of the inner works of the house. The words have stopped, and the only song now is the trickling chime of a leaky toilet and the slap of the mail through, through the slot. A check is peeking through its waxy window. Thirty dollars, a small sum for a poem I decide to use to pay a plumber. Mumbling, spud, nut, gasket, teflon, Randy Walker Jr. arrives, talks to himself and his tools. We'll get this bugger yet, he tells his wrench, muttering in plumber's dialect. A ratchet, flush valve, pig's nose, secret syllables from an ancient tribe, or I'll split this toilet in two. The nut is stripped. The spud won't go right. Time is money, he says, and gets his head right down there with the serpentine pipes, calcified sludge and rust. Wraps his thick putty fingers, the stump of one chopped off at the joint, around the toilet's neck, sings of a snake-hearted woman who's not coming back. These toilets is funny things, he says, wiping liver-colored paste on his pants, where the stains of the world's waste are evident, as the strain now of digested eggs and tea, of rumblings and protest in kidney and lower intestine. There is nothing to do but suffer his manic mumbling and bad plumber's blues, till I can roost above the white ceramic hole, survey the order and wreckage of my kingdom, and all the foul byproducts of this sweet life can be swept away. How grateful I will be for the magic of Randy Walker, Jr., virtuoso of fittings and pipes, willing to delve into the muck, set free all that is stopped, so I can turn with joy and relief back to the white, deserted page and write, all morning the sun has slipped in and out of dishwater haze. We all need plumbers. <laughs> this last poem I'm going to read is one I just worked on not too long ago. And um, it doesn't have a finished title yet. It's got a tentative title right now of Angel of Brown Street. And um, I live on this wonderful street. In fact, by coincidence, someone was just asking if we still live on Brown. It's, it's, I love the street. I, I, I always wanted to live in the Tower District, and I really feel fortunate to live there. It's just a real neighborhood, and um, there is there's a, a kid on our street named Angel. We've kind of watched him grow up. He's he was he's always been a real friendly kid, you know, coming by to talk, and and he and his brother collect cans, which we save for him, or they used to. Now Angel is growing up, so he's getting cool, and he has the need to be cool now. So he doesn't collect the cans anymore, his little brother does. He probably shares in the profits. <laughs> but, um, and he also doesn't wave to us the way he used to. He used to be waving, you know, and now he just kind of lifts his hand like this. <laughs> he doesn't want to be unfriendly, I think, but he also, you know, doesn't want to risk um, not being cool or having his friends see him waving to older people, you know. <laughs> so. This poem is really about him and, and his brother and the kids. They play in the street a lot, which I just love. I love to sit on the porch. We have a trellis there, so they can't really see up on our porch very good. And, and I love to sit there and watch them play in the street and, and um, cuss and yell and do all the stuff that they do. 
Angel of Brown Street. Sweet Angel has grown too cool to play street games, trading insults from the sidelines under a raider's cap with his brother's friends. I give them flat tennis balls, they pop up to a thumbprint moon, throwing, a, throwing beautiful Aztec curves, burnt arms offering all they have to the sun. The street narrows with swinging light. Dinner's onion breath circles overhead, chases its own tail, like Oscar who steals their ball and runs. Angel yells, his voice cracking open the dark tomb of his manhood. They spit in the street like men, flat, flirt wildly with passing cars that miss them by inches. Hey, baby, baby, homeboy, where's your puta mama? So loud they drown 98-year-old Mrs. Knight's TV where she's rocking silently to the young and the restless. We tallied deaths today, Mr. and Mrs. Nader, Charles and Loretta next door, Mr. Eagle, whose roses still open like fireworks in the spring. Old Tom, never without his paper cup of beer, and Pete, soldier of rusty couplings and loose screws, who rests now for the first time in his life. Slowly the street loosens its grip on the light. Shadows slide from under dark umbrellas of Chinese elm. Someone calls to me, so faint, it could be light years away. And I could be running against the darkness again, my mouth open to the perfume of freedom and fear, ready to take it all in. The first star on Brown Street flares, red and impatient above. Angel and Gilbert clack a stick home, the street bursting in one last furious argument of who lost or won. Omar's so, um, Omar Shalini is going to read next. And, uh, so we'll play this Thank you. Omar Salinas has given us a feast of poetry over the years. Poems of laughter and sorrow, poems of cross purposes and conflict, poems of resistance and strength, poems of strife and feelings, poems of uncooperative loves and reckless courage, poems of blunt quarrels and aggressive enterprises. His poems are remarkable for their finesse in taking a small detail, something lost in the shuffle, and using it to elicit the strongest emotions. I don't think there is anything that increases the size of the intellect more than confronting emotional reality. His poetry does this and gives back a world with a different ordering of things, a different sense of what is possible. Over the years, I've come to see Omar's work as a scholarship of dignity and solitude and poems of lyrical intensity. He has given us so many fine books and poems, Crazy Gypsy, Afternoon of the Unreal, Darkness Under the Trees, Walking Behind the Spanish, Prelude to Darkness, Sadness of Days, Selected New Poems, Survivors. Salinas has won the Stanley Kunitz Award in 1989, the General Electric Foundation Award in 1984, 
He was invited to read at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. in 1985. There's a new book, Sometimes Mysteriously, which will appear in the spring of 1992. I'm uh, real glad to have Omar come up here and read. Would you please come up, Omar? Clock up here. Timer. <clears throat> it's good. Uh, I'd like to Chuck. Chuck and I go way back. Uh, when when I first met Chuck, he was a gardener. He was a gardener at uh, President Spade. He came in one lunch uh, time, and uh, he was hungry and he was out of money, so I put out all my change and he has a meal. We've been friends since. Okay. I'm going to start with uh, the older poems and maybe chronologically work up to the newer, newer stuff uh, from this book, Sanus of Days, which is available up front. This poem is titled Going North for my grandfather whom I knew very briefly only uh, maybe a matter of two years, I was around six or seven, so it's not really about him, but it's for him. Those streets in my youth, hilarious and angry, cobblestone by mestizos, fresh fruit and dancing beggars, gone are the soldiers and the nuns. My Portuguese friends have gone north, the schoolgirls, have ripened overnight. I hum Spanish tunes waiting for the bus in Fresno. These avenues I watch, carefree, young, open collared, like my grandfather, who died in a dream, going north. This poem is from my first book, uh, Nights and Days. I am alone, and with me the roads, as empty containers. If you become saddened by the suffering butterflies, look to the right, and you see a town. On the other side, where the neighbors hide themselves like swallows, working in hell for low pay. I could have imagined this a world before, but not this night of darkness, not this night. I have a request here. My friend John Weinberg, whom I shared a, a house with years ago, uh, he had a dog, uh, Collie, uh, his name was Moses. And uh, at one of those evenings uh, came this poem. Late evening conversation with my friend's dog Moses after watching Visconti's The Innocent. Moses, who is there to save us from the crickets? Those small gods in armor, nagging some vague truths, strange, transient as Visconti's light through the arbors of grape and lilac. I think the loquats have been sleeping like our guardian angels, and who is to say what the moon is thinking, or the lost fragments of our hearts? It could all be the end of air and liquor, rain, or self-indulgence. You complain about each leaf of the apricot falling. I, too, could catalog each woman that failed to save me, and we both could be as melancholy as clouds. Moses, there are no prophecies in the sky. Only this earth, it's gray at our fingertips. Let's stop bitching about death and the light of the lovers on the veranda next door. I want to explain, as you should too, about the meekness of all the nights that have passed, burned out stars and storms. We must take control of the air and breathe as only we can, like the icy throat of comets. 
Listen to me, Moses. We're not a biblical reign, but our transgressions go to the sea in search of speech. Salt or otherwise, blood or otherwise, things remain the same as long as we watch the fiddles turn. And despite the women, the rise and fall of French cinema, the heart must dance like lightning, burn and save itself. last poem uh, in an anthology titled How Much Are You Worth? Just seldom read. Uh, I don't know why tonight I want to read it. Come sit with poverty for an hour. Capitalism is a large room with idiotic stairs and seagulls might as well recite the rosary. Money that runs its hand over your face. Anger that has not approached justice. Come sit by the martyrs of the highway. Tie the shoelace of the beggar. Come make yourself useful. Boil an egg fry some cheese, run after senators and stop their cars, wash the feet of the poor. This poem I wrote while I was living on uh, Park Avenue in Fresno. We have a Park Avenue in Fresno. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, right in the ghetto, you know, it's ghetto, ghetto as it can get. And, um, uh, had a nice picture. Anyway, this is this title, Last Tango in Fresno. Midnoon, and I'm between Pastrami and a dream. In love with bad love, I put out my cigarette and count my blessings. Bad karma, no lover. I want to seduce the nearest woman and run off to the nearest motel, but the nearest woman is thinking of vegetables and buying a gift for her lover. So I walked down the avenue, feeling great and important, and bump into a lesbian friend who's out of work and needs a job. I give her five bucks and feel that in the next life, I'll get it all back. <laughs> Here's another poem that I've seldom read. It's titled, This is About the Way It Should Be. I listen to the frantic philosophy of swallows on Forgotten Tuesdays at our reunion where everyone appears to be drunk, idly moved with indifference, or sadly scratching. I'm then reminded of my poor manners, posthumous remarks on literature and the avant-garde. I'm told repeatedly that I am crazy, that I make a poor husband, and that I will end a bad death. I will all this as surreal, Toledo, my home state, and all the illegitimate children I wish I'd had. I give all this to the political who eulogized my name without knowing I was still alive and writing. Last of all, I give this poor rendering of my emotional state to a woman who wants everything, even my shoes. Oh, try the newer poems. It's a type of getting around. As I recall, uh, John Weinberg uh, helped edit this poem. I, I remarked to him, he didn't remember, but he did. He did. Getting around. I sat down to get a better look at a woman, a woman and discovered it was only a shadow. My godfather was having his left leg amputated and had down three drinks and was out on the street feeling okay. Tuesday, I will be getting a fat check. And Wednesday, I will kiss the ass of the world. I thought about what they do with the parts of us that are dead. I thought about my mother and wanted to die at two o'clock in the afternoon to the heat, see her here on earth. But I'm still here, and the sky is the same as I wander out of lost and clouded valleys of sleep. Night Waltz. The night begins with its blind tap dancers in the fog, ghosts playing cards in the moonlight. This is the inner world of a poet who peers intently through the haze. All this cut in with a snap of the fingers, a kiss from a luminous woman. This is the madness left over from evening, come down from the moon, bitten clouds and blue tops of the elms to haunt me. This is the whirling environment of animals in the half-light. With a little luck, the evening could digress into an interlude of violins, into a sleeping woman with a book of prayers by her side. Around all this, the air whispers, 
and children circle the mountain for home. The survivors. It's a poem comes out of a chapbook out of uh, Philadelphia, done by a friend of mine, friend, 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 friend of mine. Uh, it hasn't appeared anywhere else, just the survivors. October and the moon as quiet as the acacias, as a woman who sleeps with her eyes open. A few roses look me in the eye and I don't know whether I'm awake or not, whether 50 years of dreaming have caught up with me. My mother's best dreams are of a childhood on a farm, but I remember my uncle telling me how her mother died at the age of 23, how she put matches in a jar with water and drank it. It too must have been October, and now I have no one to give my soul to, caught like a child in a game with darkness. I chase my lady friend Gloria in a dream to wherever it takes me, a woman at the end of the road who quietly sings with no one near but me, the frost-bitten earth, the sun, and pigeons pecking our hands. Mary in the Fields. A love song on the car radio ends and I'm on my way home to grape, peach, plum, and almond orchards. The fruit is ripe and workers ruminate in the fields as the sun burns down. I work my mind and the mariachi on the radio works as well. I remember Mary and her nipples of fruit, her fierce eyes and her devotion to cats and farm animals. How she said goodbye with a lusty kiss, her earthen smell, her lively hips of clouds. The beginning of enthusiasm. The day with its children begins, and I, the friendly follower of dusk, look fondly at the women shopping for men. The mask I wear is one with a wry grin, sea-bound and worthy. It's as if a new road opened up in my life, and I, sitting on a train, wave goodbye. It's as if the world rolled me inside to a batch of prayers, and hope put on its coat among feminine whispers. I am the merchant on the edge of a marquee saying poetry for sale, and I, the poet, live in the soft embrace of handkerchiefs, in the swollen rivers, in the market, in the ghetto swift slap. Yes, I live away from the insane, the suicides, sharpening my tongue, waiting for my key to a room for my imaginary wife and my chauffeur, an angel who will get me there on time. Paul is in uh, on a sheet titled My 50 Plus Years Celebrate Spring. I said plus years, I didn't want to say 54. You know, that sounds 50 plus, you could say, man, he's 51, really, you know. <laughs> My 50 plus years celebrate spring. On the road, the mountains in the distance are at rest in a wild blue silence. On the side of the highway, the grape orchards unfurl deep and green again like a pregnant woman gathering strength for the time to come. And with the passing of each season, human life knows little change. Forty years in this valley, the wind, the sun building its altars of salt, the rain that holds nothing back, and with the crop at its peak, packing houses burn into morning. There are many diligent Mexican workers stacking up the trays in hard hours that equal their living. I've heard it said, hard work and noble to spirit. If that is the case, the road to heaven must be crowded beyond belief. My father and I are close. Uh, I used to live in Lindsay for a few years, and that's where uh, I got the idea of this poem. Or not the idea, I actually. I would converse with him, interview him, son, to father. My father's a simple man. I walk to town with my father to buy a newspaper. He walks slower than I do, so much slow up. The street is filled with children. We argue about the price of pomegranates. I convince him it is the fruit of scholars. 
He has taken me on this journey and it's been lifelong. He sure I'll be healthy so long as I eat more oranges and tells me the orange has seeds and so it's perpetual and we too will come back to the orange trees. I ask him what he thinks about death and he says he will gladly face it when it comes to a boat but won't jump out in front of a car. I gladly give my life for this man with a sixth grade education whose kindness and patience are true. The truth of it is, he's a scholar. And when the bitter hard reality comes at me like a punishing evil stranger, I can always remember that he was a man who was a worker and provider who learned the simple facts in life and lived by them, who held no pretense. And when he leaves without benefit of fanfare or applause, I shall have learned what little there is to know about greatness. Good night. The good night settles in, the stars hover above like happy nuns, and I'm a sun settled, the restless finches that gather in the, this cloudless night, setting through doubts which slide into prayer and go over the sea like sailors. I'm an unhappy troubadour, hewing thoughts in the darkness, expecting the ghost or watching for meteors. The liberated lady has left with her Baudelarian guitar, strumming damnation. I go passionless under the stars, Dreaming serenades, inventing love affairs, waiting, hoping for a blue ringing of songs to be, make better nights of my troubles. Just three new poems. This summer, May 11th, I lost a dear friend, who most of you know, uh, Ernesto Trejo, the poet, Ernesto Trejo, Trejo the father, Ernesto Trejo the worker. Uh, he, he was a remarkable guy, and uh, I really felt his loss. He, I, I had promised him a poem while he was alive, and uh, sad to say, he had to wait until he died. Poem for Ernesto Trejo in memory. Gone to that place where your dreams do not carry you, my friend. We are sad as the stray dogs of winter without you. Cheerful troubadour, death forlorn, death detested, too soon taken, too soon lost of this world. Yet your voice, voice rises to the mountains, still poetic there among the sequoias, and the young evening stars stop to listen, bemused by your conversations. With the exuberance, the courage of the bullfighter, you took your place and fought. Finally, a knight came down, a black cape, a sipping Veronica, and you were gone. I direct my voice to the dust still hovering somewhere above the arena. Good night now, sweet amigo. It's in his title, Sweet Drama. On a night like this, with rain in the distant mountains, soup steaming in the kitchen, my father reads the newspaper, polite, gentle, and at peace with himself nearing his 80th birthday. There's little in the news that disturbs him now. He is happy God has given him a long life, a woman to love, and a son who knows enough to walk outside and praise the olive groves and figs, to whistle along with the sunlight as the boat saunter along the quiet farming roads. My mother sleeps the sleep of angels, the blue sleep of gardenias touched by moonlight. Today she poured orange juice on her cereal by mistake. She smiled and shook her head. All day here as the makings of a sweet drama. I have uh, two or three more poems. I'll finish up. Women in my youth. The women in my dreams are faceless and speak a strange language. On meeting me again, they revert back to their teens, proud and hard at 17, bold and ambitious in simple cotton dresses, pretty caged with long dark braids, sad Gloria, always with twilight in her eyes, 
exchanged crazy sending notes of forgiveness to the trees and to me. There are the distant Madonnas of a troubled youth, old as the roses standing up to winter, and still I see them young, enterprising, and lovely in the lost air. Most of you know Gary Soto, prolific writer from Albany, New Berkeley. Uh, this poem came out of um, a day in the sun out there, a day in the ocean out there near Santa Barbara, or by Santa Barbara. Uh, Soto thinking of the ocean. With the sun's performance dying slowly, Soto thinks of the ocean. The powerful, the weak, and the restless inhabit the shore like drunk priests. A puff of smoke and a woman full-breasted walks the afternoon. A crazy child who goes before us and soda is in the water again. Ointment for youth, old age and belligerence. Blessings which come our way like goats flushed from the hills. The ocean, goddess, immutable, tempest of water. The incoming waves catch us in our amazement that we are mortal, that we could drown near shore and be remembered, be recognized like strong tobacco, and like pelicans considered in a strange way romantics. We're all being beaten by the waves under this other sky. Until heaven gets tired. This poem was written in uh, Mexico, Guadalajara, 1976, I believe. Until heaven gets tired. In this curious mad evening, when the things I invent are unreal and my life like a cow sings crudely, I make the villages in my brain whistle at the girls. There are drums and flutes, women milking shadows in this fleeting residence. I leave my prayers here in this palace of bad stomachs. My heart is young again and I pick up my faces. Mexican madness, tequila and flowers raining down from heaven. What wild dream is this? These hands of mine groan. I toss them at the wind. It is the sea I listen to. These carcasses and cunts stealing nectar from the dreaming stars. I must have drunk a mad star or dreamed this dream. This life so difficult to understand. Let's chase ghosts and dance with women in the street. Frolic in the dawn until heaven gets tired of looking at our dirty faces. This poem, I titled it Magnificent Your Gift, and it's to Friends with Troubles. It's my last poem. I collapse into the awareness that life has been fighting me. The question is, from what corner of the room shall I slash and scream Victoria's smile? My feet ache from walking. I rebel slowly turning into the quarters of the mind, believing I'm an angel. Yesterday I lived like a bird. Today I adore roses. Tomorrow I'll weep, looking at the white bones of mountains. Maybe if I remember the dying, I'll be all right. I have a dog that follows me from room to room like a doctor. The wives of the moon sit silent. The berserk seagull dances on the shore. I live the music in me, gazing at a train that never stops, tripping into bars, thinking of churches, and dancing with a girl with the heart of an angel, the eyes of a dove, the arms of a Madonna. As I said, life is fighting me. I shall aim it below at its ears, breathing poetry, counting stars in the evening, floating with the universe, thanking God for this gift, this life. Thank you. Thank you.